This is your life. Now, as most of you know, we've traveled many a long distance to spring our surprises, and I've ended up in some very odd places, to say the least of it. Now, I want to tell you where I'm going tonight to find our extraordinary but unsuspecting guest of honor. I'm going right here to our studio audience. Now, if all our plans have been accurate, the person I'm looking for should be here somewhere tonight. I've never met, but... Uh, and I can see, looking at the faces anyway, there's many a good story to tell. <laughs> There's an interesting face up there. Oh, God. <laughs> Where do you hail from? Uh, well, I'm at Kensington High Street Patrol Unit, uh, aim and uh, Naval Police. Naval Police, have yeah. you been abroad? Yeah, I just come back from Singapore. Bet you've got a few tales to tell. Well, yeah, it could be exit if you What's your name? Uh, Lynn Reg Holland. Well, that story's going to come another time, but it's not on this one here. <laughs> Well, let's see. What about this lady here right beside me? <laughs> Where do you come from? Roma. Roma? Yes. Ah, I'm picking all the romantic spots. What's your name? Enza. Enza? Yes. Not the name here yet. <laughs> and we haven't, don't often see a, a reverend in the audience. How are you, sir? Not too bad, Ian. Where do you hail from? Crosby. Crosby. Near Liverpool. Near Liverpool. Is that where you've just come from? No, South America. South America? From Lima. Lima, Peru. Yes, yes. You've got a special interest in Peru and the starving people there and many other places besides, haven't you? Sure. Yes. You have. Your name is? Father O'Leary. Oh, Father Lord. Francis O'Leary. <laughs> Tonight, this is your life. Oh, I want to tell you before, before we even start, I've got a second surprise for you because we've been keeping 25 seats and hiding 25 people. Some of your friends from Liverpool are helping you work. You can come in now, the lot of you. Oh, no. <laughs> you can see them all afterwards, too. <laughs> Your hair is great. <laughs> well, <clears throat> you'll be seeing all them later anyway at the party, and I'm sure, since I know that in fact you are on your way to a meeting about the only thing that interests you, which is your work, Fortunately for us, our colleague Tom Brennan is an old school pal, so I imagine you'll have a few things to say to him afterwards. I but... will, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, Father Francis O'Leary, this is your life, a life of struggle, hardship and unceasing dedication that is taking you, the son of a scrap metal merchant, on a round-the-world mission of mercy. A Mill Hill father, you've travelled thousands of miles across the oceans from your home in Liverpool, first east to West Pakistan to Raul Pindi, where shocked by the appalling poverty and needs of the people, you built for them in the foothills of the Himalayas a hospital. And then in answer to a call for help, you span the world westwards to South America, to Colombia and Peru, where you built more hospitals. First, for the isolated and poverty-stricken people of San Bernardo del Viento. And later for the desperately poor urban dwellers near to Lima. And in the past decade, you've achieved the near miracle of bringing comfort to a half million starving and destitute people. Uh, an achievement you first dreamt about when you were just a little boy 
living here with your late parents <laughs> at number four Enfield Avenue, Crosby, near Liverpool, as you told me earlier, as if I didn't know. And two special admirers have traveled from Liverpool to be here tonight, your sister Rita and your brother Arthur. <laughs> Well, now, Rita, I know that uh, both you and Arthur are proud of your brother's achievements, but they came as no surprise to you, did they? No, no, because from an early age, he wanted to help people, and he told my mother this. Well, help people you did in a big way, Father, that has won you the love and respect and admiration of people all over the world. But Rita, when he first began training as a missionary, he didn't uh, exactly keep to the, the strict rules, did he? No, he rather bent the rules, and uh, my mother and I used to go up to Freshfield, the college at the seminary when he was about 11 years of age and smuggled some sweets into him behind the bushes which he used to distribute i hope with some of the others <laughs> <laughs> in fact arthur before he decided to enter the church you uh, wondered if he'd choose a different career yeah i thought he'd be a musician uh, Eamon. He was, was that? singing uh, all day long, uh, Roll Out the Battle, that was the popular tune at the time. <laughs> well, Nealis drove us mad singing it. <laughs> well, Father, it wasn't your singing that uh, impressed when, as a youngster, you set sail for Ireland on a youth club camping holiday shortly after the war. There were some 40 boys on that trip 25 That's years right. ago, and one of them, a special pal, remembers yet another of your talents. I sure do. Franny still holds the youth club record for ice cream eating. He, he too became a priest. You thought he was 8,000 miles away in Peru, but he's flown across the world. Yes, to be here, your former club pal, Vincent Otter Hughes. <laughs> We didn't go to bed the other night, that's right. <laughs> Tell us about this uh, O'Leary record. Well, actually, it was just after the war, and if you remember, there were no ice creams or things, and the hungry boys we were, we went to Dublin, and where it was everything, and he had the record anyway, with, while we were there, he had 41 ice creams. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for all the Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of other things you're going to find out before the night is through. Uh, 1948, you transferred to Burn Hall, Durham, and later moved to the Mill Hill College near London. And there, the uh, live wire from Liverpool uh, made another reputation, this time as a goalkeeper in the college first eleven, and became a football expert off the field. Frank was the founder member of the O'Leary Football Pool Syndicate. He was in that same football team <laughs> as McKinnon. well. Yes, you're right, 20 years ago, Jimmy McKinnon. <laughs> Now, Jimmy, you better explain this. A pool syndicate in a religious college is a little bit irregular. Would you tell us more about it? Yes, indeed, it was very irregular. But, you know, most things Frank did in the college were pretty irregular. <laughs> and uh, we, we, we were very star for entertainment. And, and this guy, being a Liverpudley and was football mad and, and crazy on Liverpool, and uh, he decided to organize O'Leary Enterprises football pool. And so the, the stakes were actually handmade cigarettes. We rolled our own grotty cigarettes and put them in a tin can. And Frank would send the tin can around on a Saturday night and all those who wanted to participate put in their two fags. And then somehow or other, I don't know how he ever did it, I think he must have had a radio concealed. He used to go at six o'clock and get the, the scores. And if you were very lucky, you got a soggy mass of 30 or 40 hand-rolled fags as your prize. I, I take it there's not a word of a lie in all that. Absolutely true, Eamon. <laughs> I understand, too, that you were also a bit of an expert on cricket. He was the only one I knew who could go into the confession box and come out with the latest test score. <laughs> That's a voice you haven't heard for 17 years that we found him, another college pal, Brian Conneller. <laughs> Brian, we need a few more explanations. Test scores from the confessional box. You better clear that one up for us. Well, he, he was about 14 at the time, and um, he was mad on sport, and I use the word advisedly. <laughs> and um, he was always wanting the sports results, but it, the, the college was very strict. It was a cross between Colitz, Colitz and Stalag 49, <laughs> and there were no newspapers, no radio, and no television, and 
um, one was pinned down every night at study, so there was no contact with the outside world. But on Saturday nights, one could go to confession. And I know, I know the priest he went to, he, he wasn't a, a sports fan by any means, but I don't know how he managed to persuade him with what a mixture of, of charm and, and tact. But um, Franny always came back with the sports results afterwards. <laughs> and if you wanted to know the sports results, you had to go and see Franny. I'm sure he's not going to tell us how he worked that. But thank you, Brian, and thank you, Jimmy. <laughs> Do you, oh, you want to let us into the secret how you got the test scores? It was very e easy, really, you know, just... Well, he didn't have to have any mortal sins, really, otherwise he wouldn't have got them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, those jokes provided the laughs to break the years of rigorous training for your chosen vocation as a missionary. In 1956, you were ordained a priest, and after further training at Glasgow University, you were given your first posting to Pakistan that was to take you away from home for eight years. Do you remember now how you felt, in fact, when you left England? Well, pretty miserable. Uh, I went on the Cilicia, and it was hard, because I didn't know what was coming up. I was going to teach in a school there. Um, the date you left, in fact, was uh, November, the, November 5th. the 5th, 1960. Yes. The young missionary father here, Francis O'Leary, set sail from his native Liverpool for Karachi in West Pakistan. Now, when he arrived there in the foothills of the Himalayas, he stood on the threshold of a dream. <laughs> His first job, as he told us, was to act as a teacher, a teacher, in fact, to the children in this very school. But as every free moment was spent wandering among the people who lived in these slums and shocked by the poverty he saw, he decided to act. But speaking no Urdu, you needed help, and you got help from this Quadras. lady. Mrs. Quadras. Quadras, that's right. How did she help you? Well, she was a marvellous, she marvellous woman, Mrs. Quadras, and everywhere I went, um, if you wanted any help at all, just ask Mrs. Quadras and she'd always give it to you. And you know she's not in West Pakistan tonight. For the first time in her life, she's in England. She's flown 4,000 miles to be with you tonight. <laughs> Millie Quadras. <laughs> Millie, back home, you're a, a housewife. Tell us how you first came to work with Father O'Leary. Well, I remember one night, about 10.30 at night, Father knocked at the door and said, well, I've been sent for a need to help him. Well, I said, well, Father, I'm there to help you any time in it as a language problem or any other work. Well, it didn't take long for Father to come back and say that he has found an old lady lying, dying, unwanted by anyone. So he says, we've got to help her and put her in the hospital. Well, we tried a place for her to get in the hospital. She had, has a, what, incurable illness where there was no place for her. Then, of course, Father says, well, we've got a room, a house. It's a little mud house. It is in a parish ground, which Father tried and made into a home for the old lady to be in a rest before she dies in a comfortable And that's what, how it started to start to make a hospice for the incurable Poor, incurable, sick, isn't it? Right? Now, this was just uh, a mud hut, and he dreamed of, of a hospital. But when he talked about his plans, most others were skeptical about the chances. Yes, everyone said, well, it is impossible for a man to start like this with no funds, no money. Well, it was, I know what his father Larry is like, you know. That is typical of him, which he says, no, we've got to have it. And well, he kept up to it, and we managed to have it. Thank you, Mary Quadros. Thank you. Everybody there was poor, and it seemed an impossible dream when in 1963 the Bishop of Royal Pindi gave you three months' leave of absence from your parish work to try to raise the money to build that very first hospital. How, in fact, did he do it, Millie? Well, he went to Karachi, about a thousand miles off from Pindi, and were hoping to raise some funds for us. And I think he went and met a friend of his who he met on the boat, the ship, to help, and so she helped him to raise some funds for us and that's how it started so you were you were on your way 
and because of that help, less than a year later in West Pakistan, you were able to lay the foundation for your very first hospital. You called it St. Joseph's Hospice, now in fact part of Jospice International. Now today that hospital in Pakistan has a dedicated nursing staff who care for the needs of more than 100 inpatients and many more outpatients. And it's to there we go now to hear from the woman who for the past 10 years has helped you run it. Mother Dolores. That's right, your friend and helper, Mother Dolores. Salam Farachi. I wanted to say you thank you for giving us the opportunity to work here among our dear patients. I am sorry not to pass with you this evening, but it's not possible for me in this occasion. Salam alaikum. Salam. Well, with Mother Dolores, three other special friends who cannot be here either want to talk to you. A little boy you were asked to baptize with a name not often heard in Royal Pindi. <laughs> a young woman yes. uh, seven years ago was an abandoned cripple, and this local schoolgirl who was inspired to help Hello, you. Father, Hello, I am Rita speaking to you. Um, I am very happy to uh, uh, talk a few words and I remember you father, you was very kind to us and no I am studying, I am passed in 8th class, I stood 3rd in my class father, I do come sometime to the hospice to, to, to see the patients and meet the sisters, here uh, Francis O'Leary is standing, who you, who you were kind to? Hello? Hello, Father. I am a lady. I am a lady. Uh, Hello, Father Ji. How are you? I am quite well. I have spent five years here. And thank you very much indeed for taking such good care of us all. We are very grateful to Mother Dolores. I am so happy now because I have gone back home and I have also got married. God bless you, Father. Goodbye, Father. Thank you, Anwar Jan, Mother Dolores, Rita, and of course, Francis O'Leary II. <laughs> I want to explain that, Roland. Yes, yes. You better. <laughs> No, well, the reason why there's uh, Francis O'Leary in Pakistan at the moment, <laughs> <laughs> there's, uh, this lady was, was going to have a baby and she said, Father, if it's a boy, it's going to be called after you. And they don't have um, surnames as we have them. So they called it O'Leary Francis, and, but now they've changed it around to suit the same as mine, Francis O'Leary. So there's a little Punjabi called Francis O'Leary there. The name's perpetuated now. <laughs> Well, now, for you, Father, the joy of Raoul Pindy turned to sorrow in 1966 when you returned home to Liverpool to find your widowed mother had suffered a severe stroke and had been left virtually paralyzed. Now, sadly, she died two years ago. During your stay in Liverpool, you meet again your old pal here, Vincent Hughes. Now, Vincent, you put a suggestion to him, didn't you? Yeah, well, at the time, I Eamon, I was out in South America, <clears throat> and as you know, as everybody knows, the poor, the poverty out there is considerable. And I suggested to him that perhaps we could have something out there in the way of a hospital to help. Uh, I perhaps shouldn't have suggested it to him because any suggestion made to help the sick or the poor, he takes up even though he's no money. He never has any money. Well, why never... were you so confident he could raise the money? Well, um, although he has no backing of any kind from any official organization that I can find, um, he just badges people, he goes to people he doesn't know, he never met before, he gets on the phone to them, he goes to see them, he knocks at the door, and just won't take no for an answer because he's so, he seems so convinced of the need, and of course the need is there. And he built the hospital? He did, he built, well he built the one in Negritos, but he built three others as well in, in South America, up to, the, up to this moment. I don't mention any more in case he decides to, to do it, but he's, um, he built one in, in Colombia and two in Lima since right. then, as well as Negritos. Well, this was a great achievement only yesterday, and this is how you've just flown 18 hours I'm back. Just come back. I know. <laughs> only yesterday earned you the official cooperation of the Peruvian government. At your side in Lima yesterday, a friend from Liverpool who was there to act as your Spanish interpreter. Now, she was keeping all the time the secret of this program. She and what you also don't know is that as soon as you left for the airport, an hour later, she took another plane and flew the 8,000 miles here. Just back, Philomena O'Leary. <laughs> Well, 
Philomena, you're no relation to Father O'Leary, but you've worked alongside him in Liverpool for the past six years. That's true. How did that happen? Well, I was bashing out egg, chips and beans one dinner hour. There was a rush on because seven children wanted to get back to school. And Father walked in. He knew I had a Spanish grandmother and that I spoke Spanish. And he said, could you help me for one hour every fortnight, Father? And he stepped up the work rate, Jess? Somewhat. <laughs> it's become a full-time job, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it involves the whole family. We haven't been to bed since last Sunday. <laughs> What's your house known as now, Phil? Mission station number one. Mission station number one. And the family are talking about numbers 11. So from mission station uh, number no. one, they're all <laughs> here tonight, the O'Leary family. Dear. Phil's husband, Terry, and children. Anne-Marie. Dear. Oh, dear. Come The twins, Claire and Bernadette. Elizabeth and the baby of the family, three-year-old Patricia. <laughs> Well, about it a month ago. Of course you did. <laughs> well, Patricia, I think, is your youngest helper. And families like that and many others, Father, and the work you do help. And I know it's difficult in a program like this to, to ask you a serious question, but it is a serious question. How do you sum up what you and they are trying to achieve? Just trying to give back, or the people the, of the underdeveloped nations, or the developing nations, as they're known, to give back to the individual human dignity that uh, every person, uh, no matter how poor, in fact the very poor, should be given this human dignity as their right. And this is what Jospice in International is for. And you realize too that even in this day and age there's a need for hospitals like yours in England and the help you get from this family here, and you're talking about perpetuating the O'Leary's, you've no problem about that here, um, is making another dream possible, the opening of another hospital close to where your mother was born in Little Ormsby, a house you've renamed La Casa de San Jose, and you're hoping to take in your first patient this summer. But Rita, his care and concern uh, for the individual is, is still as strong as it was, despite all the other demands on his time, as when he first discovered that poor old woman that uh, we were told about. Yes, and if I could give you an example of this, uh, I'm nursing and a patient of mine, Anthony Formby, you remember, friend, mm, that's right. uh, who came into me, he was a, uh, he dropped out of society, he was a very well educated man, but for some reason, best known to himself, he dropped out of society, and he died uh, uh, very shortly after he'd been in, but before that, um, he had seen in a paper something about my brother's work and he asked me if I was his sister and he gave me a little matchbox and do you remember this yes, sir, yeah, with a couple of shillings wrapped in a paper handkerchief yeah. and I gave it to you and you were much touched by this and so, you uh, a little so um, yes you went to the burial but he was buried in a pauper's grave and you dashed from Southport to uh, uh, outside attend Liverpool the yes mm. to attend the funeral and therefore this man did not, uh, he was not alone. Yes, that is the plaque there, in remembrance of Francis Formby, a member of the St. Joseph Hospice Association. But before we end your story, Fanny, let's go right back to the beginning. When desperate to build your first hospital, you travelled to Karachi and remembered someone you'd met and talked to on the boat when you first sailed from England three years before. Now that woman and her husband not only gave you a roof over your head, but the first donation that was to lead to that very first hospital. Yes. Her name, of course, was Edna. Edna and Peter Pittman. That's right. She, too, has flown across the world from Karachi. Oh, really? This is Edna Pittman. No. Lost touch for a while. Yeah, we can't get over it myself. Edna, tell me, what was it that made you uh, help this man? Well, he arrived late at night, and he was very tired. Half past eleven, was yeah. Very late. In fact, he was exhausted, and we made him up a bed. But he sat far into the night, telling us about 
the plans he had for this hospice. And I may tell you, they were impossible. And I thought he was either quite mad or a saint. The first. <laughs> but when we went to bed ourselves later on, although we're not a Catholic family, I said to my husband, I think we are very blessed to have this man under our roof. I think it was his simple faith. We all know that in a journey of a thousand miles there must be a first step. But he made that first step seem so easy. And I think all I did was what everyone who's ever known him has done. He gave me that card. Believed in him. Father Francis O'Leary, this is your life. Thank you. Time for our service of worship for Trinity Sunday. It's a family mass celebrated by Father Vincent Hughes in St. Mary's Roman Catholic Church, Low House, St. Helens. Commentary is by Father Ernest Sands. St. Helens, Merseyside. St. Mary's is one of the town parishes in the middle of St. Helens, and it also houses a residential vocation center for men who are interested in knowing more about the Catholic priesthood. The mass begins with the procession and insensation. At one time, emperors and kings were incensed, we do it now to show respect, and the celebrant incenses one of the focal points of the Mass, the altar, where the sacrament will be celebrated. Later, the deacon will do the same with the Book of Gospels. <laughs> 